Okay, welcome to our webinar today. We will talk about uh, the tourist management and the COVID-19, about the research priority and changing publishing landscape. And uh, it is so fantastic to see how many of you have joined us today. I'm your host, Candice, from Sage Asia Pacific Marketing Team. And firstly, I'd just like to mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with you some days later by email. So uh, you can watch back the recording if you wish. We've got lots of great topics to discuss today. So let's dive in and welcome our panelists. We have Professor Chris Cooper from the School of Events, Tourism, and Hospitality Management at Leeds Beckett University. And we also have Professor Haiyan Song from Hong Kong Polytechnic University, who is the Associate Dean in the School of Hotel and Tourism Management. And finally, uh, Ms. Xu Ting Wang from Sage Publishing Asia Pacific. Uh, today, with, uh, we will, after our panelist speech, we will be finishing up with the question and answer section. So if you would like to ask any of our panelists a question, please feel free to type your questions on Q&A board at the right side of your screen. And that's it. That's it from me, so we will turn it over to Professor Cooper. Okay, thank you. I just need to share my screen with you. Okay, can you see the screen? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good. Okay. Well, for me, it's morning, everyone. I know for some of you it's afternoon. I know for some of you it's evening, and, and probably for some of you it's good night. But what I would like to do today is to speak about the research opportunities and priorities that COVID-19 presents to the tourism sector. Um, I want to also look at the link between COVID and climate change, and I want to finish by looking at some of the implications of COVID for academic publishing in tourism. So, and I must also make an apology that for some reason these slides have become animated. <laughs> uh, so what we have with COVID-19 and tourism is an unprecedented crisis. We haven't seen a crisis like this for tourism in our own lives, but it's also a transformative crisis. To COVID not only is a problem, but it's also accelerated a number of trends which are already happening in the tourism sector. So we all are so familiar with Zoom, so familiar with Microsoft Teams, and I think that will remain with us once the pandemic is finished. So it's accelerating certain trends, accelerating trends of working from home, which is changing the relationship between leisure time and work time. And, for, and COVID-19, for tourism, it's a victim and a vector. Yes, it's a victim in terms of the crisis that it's created, but tourism is also a vector of COVID in terms of air travel and people traveling around the world. Certainly we've, we've had an issue with that here in the UK. So what does that mean for tourism research? As I said, we've, we've had Zoom. What it means is we need to look at pandemics and tourism. What we have here is a very well, a global pandemic, so the spread geographically is very wide, it's, it's global. It's spread by transmission from location to location, hence the importance of, of tourism as, as a, a vector of, of, of COVID. It has very high attack rates and high death rates. Multiple cases occur very quickly within a short time. And until recently with the, the vaccines, there has been minimal immunity in the population. Younger people seem to be less uh, effective than, than older people. And we're seeing new variants, novel variants all the time coming out. So this is a serious issue for tourism and, and one that really has transformed tourism. So we have two types of response to COVID-19. The first is the pharmaceutical response. Vaccines, which are now being rolled out ac across the world, and we will have vaccine passports. 
and, and they're proving to be quite controversial in terms of how they discriminate uh, between different groups in society. But there's no doubt that the vaccine will be a savior for tourism. But we also have the non-pharmaceutical response, and this is the one that has been so damaging for tourism, with, with lockdowns where hospitality, theme parks, attractions are all closed, social distancing, huge impact on reconfiguring destinations, reconfiguring attractions, and changing the relationship, I think, between psychological carrying capacity and social carrying capacity. But I'll come back to that. Closures of businesses, closures of, of supply chains, cancellation of events, bans of gatherings, such as, say, wedding, and, and obviously travel bans, which are so harmful for our sector. So what does this mean for research? What I would argue is that there are a number of, of, of areas for research. And I know Professor Song will speak about tourist behavior, so he will deal with the demand side. I will deal with, with more the supply side, if you like. So for research, social distancing and carrying capacity, the economics of, say, theme parks have been affected. And we're starting to see papers on this coming out now. And we're seeing rebuilding of destinations, pressing that, that reset button to say, what do we need to do? to rebuild our destination after COVID. And I'll talk about this in, in a few minutes. But of course, when we're looking at research, not all destinations are equal when it comes to the impact of COVID. Some have been much harder hit. So if we think of, of the game parks in Africa, completely closed, affecting the animals, affecting the economy. Alpine tourism, nothing else they can do. They don't have other options. Coastal tourism as well. So. There is lots of research potential out there for tourism researchers. We've gone from over-tourism to under-tourism. And looking at the implications of under-tourism for some destinations uh, is, is proving a very rich seam of research. And there are a number of papers on this already. Professor Song will speak about forecasts. I, I won't speak about that. <laughs> research on the value chain as, as the impact is rippling through right down back to the farmers impact on incomes and therefore travel as people are furloughed, people lose their jobs because of, of COVID, and impact on businesses as well. So thinking here particularly about participation of, of employees, the health of employees, there's a lot of work being done on that, the well-being of, of tourism employees, and businesses in terms of strategic th rethinking. Think, for example, of the cruise sector, which has been so hard hit, the airline sector too. But on a brighter side, I would argue that the research is also supporting recovery strategies. There are now a lot of papers on how research is supporting recovery to protect jobs in terms of liquidity, protecting jobs, bringing confidence back to protect businesses, opening borders responsibly, and new technologies such as virtual reality in terms of starting to, to grow much more quickly than it would have without the pandemic. So we're seeing policy response from the, the international level with the World Tourism, the UN World Tourism Organization, the World Travel and Tourism Council. We're seeing it regionally and locally. And we're also seeing it by different sectors. So the, the event sector, the airline sector are all putting together these strategies which are underpinned by research. And so hopefully we will move with the vaccine we will move to a new normal. We will start to see something I've spoken of already in terms of the social distancing. And that will become the norm, certainly in this country, for, for probably another at least 12 months. It means restaurants are having to install plexiglass screens. It means staff are being protected with masks. It means deep cleaning, sanitizing will become, has already become, the norm in hospitality. Optional cleaning of hotel rooms, we've probably already seen that. Enforced closure as well. Contactless payment for pretty much everything. In the UK, it's unusual now to use cash. Everything is contactless with, with payments. So the day-to-day -day operation of tourism is changing, and it's, again, a rich research scene in terms of how everything is booked in advance, say meals, 
that type of thing. Just e even a simple coffee is now often booked in advance. Domestic tourism at the moment here in the UK certainly is favoured, and I think it is in a lot of countries. Last week, we were able to stay in self-contained accommodation, self-catering accommodation. The hotels here are not yet open. But as so long as you're not sharing facilities, it's OK. So again, a, a lot of work there that can be done. So localization, domestic tourism, localization, and this has seen a growth in small tourism businesses. You might expect COVID to hit co uh, tourism in a negative way in terms of small businesses, but in fact, we've seen a growth in small businesses. So as I said, self-contained accommodation. Equally, work on promotion. There's no point in having all of these systems in place if you don't promote them. Virtual reality, the heritage sector certainly doing a lot of work on, on replacing physical destinations with, with virtual. So you don't have to meet people. You don't have to come in contact with people. And we will see vaccine passports. There's a huge theme of research here. Vaccine passports. At the moment, there is a thinking that we will start to label destinations red, green, and amber, so there'll be a traffic light system for, for destinations, and that will then depend on, on the level of quarantine that, that's required. So a lot of things potentially to look at in terms of tourism, and certainly the tourism journals that are now starting to, to fill up with this type of material, and I'll talk about that in a second. So plexiglass screens, cabins, greenhouses for social distancing in, in restaurants, Contactless payment for pretty much everything um, is certainly the experience here, and I'm sure it is in, in other countries. And new realities taking over from what could be a dangerous physical reality. And the vaccine passport, which I'm sure we will see. I know the European Union is thinking of that. A couple of things from me as well. Firstly, what has become clear to me over the last two or three months is this link between COVID-19 and climate change and tourism. And I think this is certainly a, a research priority um, for us as a group of academic researchers. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but what this diagram is basically saying is that climate hazards are exacerbating and making the pandemic worse in terms of emergency evacuations and shelters after wildfires or hurricanes water scarcity, heat waves, but most probably importantly also well, air pollution. Air pollution, because COVID obviously attacks the lungs and breathing, is, is a real issue. So let me just, and I think all of these slides will be made available to you. Let me just go through a couple of these uh, points. Firstly, the negative points, if you like. Air pollution exacerbates the impact of the virus. And that affects the less well-off, perhaps more. It affects those working because they have to go out into the air. We're also seeing the fact that economies are being hit very hard by the virus. It means that the priorities of, say, the environment in the past are now not as important. So we see the rainforest, illegal logging has come back, and the government is far too busy looking at the impact of the virus, particularly on Brazil, which is probably the worst country in the world for, for the virus at the moment. And they've taken their eye off, off the environmental section, if you like. So, it weak, so the environmental policy is weakened. It's also weakened, I think, because in the future, whereas we might have been much harder on the airlines, taxing the airlines, taxing carbon, I think that will be delayed because there's more, the airlines have suffered so much. So I suppose in a playing card, in a, in a gambling situation, at the moment, what's happened with climate change and, and, and COVID is that economics has trumped the environment. We're, we're much more caring, if you like, uh, of the economics. There are more cars around because people are not using public, certainly here, they're not using public transport because it's deemed to be more dangerous. Um, and only last week I was reading that climate change is changing the distribution of where bats are found, and obviously bats are a carrier and of, of this. So a lot happening in terms of that link between climate change and the virus. So air pollution making things worse, taking the eye off the environmental policy, environmental protection, 
letting illegal here illegal logging, but there's lots of other examples of this, I think. And redistribution of, of the bat population, in some places increasing the bat population, but also changing it in terms of where it is found. But there are some good things. We're not traveling as much, or we haven't traveled as much in 2020, which is bad for the airlines, but good for carbon, good for the environment, good for the climate. We're not using the combustion engine as much, or the airline, or the jet engine. We're walking more, we're hiking more. A number of countries, such as the Netherlands, are looking towards green recovery uh, as, as they move out of COVID. More working from home, so less transport. People moving to the countryside, certainly here in Europe, a, a trend to move out of, the, out of the city and move to the countryside. Lockdown, I think, has been a part of that, living more simply. And I suppose good for us, more faith in, in science and, and more faith uh, in experts. And so what does all of this mean? We're moving, I hope, to a new tourism when, when COVID gradually fades. And we have a once in a lifetime chance to build tourism that we can be proud of. And that should be tourism which is built on, on a foundation of research. Tourism that has reduced volumes, is carbon friendly, is sustainable, and is innovative. That is what I would like to think we will be able to move to once we get back to some semblance of, of normality. And I suppose my question back to you as an audience is, are we up to the challenge of doing this? I just want to finish with a few slides on something that I have seen over the last probably six months, and that is how COVID-19 is impacting on the academic publishing landscape generally, and therefore impacting on, on you, the audience, as a group of researchers who are looking to publish your work. And what I'm seeing is there is an impact on journal submissions, and I'll talk about that in a moment. There is an impact on the content of those journal submissions, and that is having an impact on the currency, the value of other submissions to journals generally across the tourism field. So let's take the first of those. There has been, with lockdown, since last since early 2020, a huge increase in papers, generally across tourism journals. And that, you might say, is a good thing. But what I'm also seeing is that whilst the quantity has increased, the quality has not. And I'll talk about that in a second. And it's also meant because the quantity has increased, there's more papers around, it's, it's getting harder to get referees to agree to referee papers, just because of the sheer increase in the volume of papers. Now, not only has that impacted on submissions, but it's also impacted on content. There is a COVID-19 and tourism publishing industry now. There are lots of papers coming out. Ones that I'm seeing, many, not, not all, but a lot of them are premature. We don't know how this thing is going to play out yet. And these are papers which, which are saying that we do, that they've done a piece of research and this is what will happen. And I, I don't think that's correct. A lot of them are very original and very innovative. Innovative in, in looking at, say, landscapes for making you feel happy as a tourist rather than stressed by the virus. So there's, there's lots of really original and innovative stuff out there at the moment. A lot of really good applications of different theories and methodologies to the COVID issue, I'm seeing that. All papers have a very long introduction about pandemics and tourism and COVID and tourism, and, and they're all the same. So a lot of papers could be sharper and could be tighter. But certainly there's an industry out there in, in terms of, of publishing on COVID and tourism. And that's happening. That's having an impact on other submissions. So if you're not researching tourism and COVID, then that's starting to create a bit of an issue. Some journalists, for example, are asking for a COVID perspective in every paper. The view being that it is such a major thing that we can't publish anything on tourism without 
a COVID perspective. This is also an issue for work that was done perhaps before COVID hit, so work that was done in 2019 on, say, cruise passengers or, or cruise strategies. The currency of that work, the value of that work, you could argue has been impacted by COVID because it's effectively rendered um, historic. And that's the same for empirical papers, which are pre-COVID, because they don't factor in the COVID factor. Because we're seeing so much in terms of the COVID work, it's squeezing space for other content. There isn't as much room in terms of the page budgets of the journals to get other content in because there's just so much COVID stuff coming out now. But what I would argue is that the more conceptual pieces, the, the literature reviews, the, you know, the, system, the systematic reviews and commentaries, they're, they're still generally okay. They're, they're still uh, good pieces of work that are being published. So to conclude, what I think we have is, and that, sorry, not to conclude, let me just talk about that very quickly. So I just published this book uh, about 12 months ago, a victim in a sense of publishing too soon because we don't have COVID in there. So this is a, a synoptic view of, of, of tourism, tourism in 14 chapters, so a course effectively a semester's worth of, of tourism. But there will be a fourth edition in 2022, which is effectively its entrance of tourism, the COVID issue. So it will, it will start to weave in and fold in the impact of COVID on tourism. And so my concluding slide is, is basic to say that COVID has changed the game. It's moved the goalposts with, in tourism research. It's changed the game in terms of destinations and the work we can do on destinations. And it's changed the game in terms of publishing, academic publishing. At the moment, it's different. It will change back again, I think, in the next two or three years. But at the moment, COVID is, is dominating in, in that publishing sector. I will stop at that point and hand back to the chair and look forward to some questions later on. Thank you, everyone. OK, thank you. Thank you, Professor, for sharing your insights. So next, we will welcome Professor Song for his part. OK, Hi, okay thank you. I yes. need to share the screen. So can you see the screen now? Yep. Right. Uh, uh, you're seeing the presenter's screen or the public screen now? All right. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good uh, uh, evening from uh, from Hong Kong, and also good morning, good uh, good night, uh, and good afternoon uh, from uh, participants from other places. So, uh, Professor Chris Cooper uh, promised you I will talk uh, some of the research areas. I can only deal with one or two, but not uh, all the areas that uh, Professor Cooper. Uh, promised on my behalf. I will not be talking about forecasting this time, although uh, my research area actually include uh, uh, tourism demand more than in forecasting. So, uh, so uh, uh, in in the Chinese seeing, actually, uh, Wei Ji or uh, crisis and opportunities, and that's uh, every crisis actually come with uh, opportunities. Uh, today I'm going to present uh, some of the research opportunities uh, during the pandemic, uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic and thereafter. So uh, Professor Cooper already uh, mentioned that uh, COVID-19 actually has uh, had uh, profound uh, negative impact on the tourism industry worldwide. So basically, the world uh, is locked down. Uh, there's not much uh, uh, international travel uh, going on at the moment. And also, this impact will be felt uh, far beyond the current pandemic. So this, because this uh, is uh, once in a lifetime uh, public health uh, crisis and this crisis actually lasts much longer than many other crises that we have experienced, uh, and and as a result, this impact will last much much longer uh, than we uh, anticipate. Uh, 
So, and also, uh, especially the industry uh, practitioners, uh, decision makers, and policy makers are very desperate uh, for the recovery strategies and solutions. And some of these uh, strategies and solutions uh, may actually coming from uh, from research from educators. Uh, so that's why I said, you know, this provide uh, academics with research opportunities. Uh, so uh, Professor Cooper actually uh, talked about many new possible research directions, uh, but I will mainly focus on uh, from a demand uh, perspective or from the economics perspective. Uh, so uh, the first question uh, we would ask is that uh, although this pandemic uh, is uh, a, is unprecedented and it was lost much longer. But whether this impact, this uh, pandemic actually is a one-off event or one-off will generate one-off uh, impact or long-term impact on tourism and also firm behaviors. But I were mainly talking about whether this will influence uh, the tourist travel behavior uh, as a result. But if actually, if this impact is one off, although it is bigger and longer. Uh, in effect, the existing research or existing theoretical framework should still be very useful and relevant uh, to deal with uh, the impact of COVID-19 on tourism. Right. Uh, the only thing that we need to do is that we include uh, a COVID uh, factor, which may uh, influence the travel uh, decisions uh, during this period and maybe short, uh, short uh, uh, right uh, after the pandemic, but then the tourists will return to normal. Uh, Professor Cooper already mentioned that the tourists may actually return to a new normal, but we don't know whether it will be a new normal or uh, the memory of tourists will be short and they will forget what has happened um, during the pandemic and then start uh, doing the same thing as before, right? Or the impact is long term. But if the impact is long term, which means uh, the tourists perhaps will change their travel behavior as a result. And the way uh, they uh, look for information, the way they were booking their uh, international travel uh, or accommodations, uh, and also uh, you know, the, the, the destinations they will travel to may actually significantly change as a result of this COVID-19. And so the, if this uh, behavioral change is long term, then actually the new theories or extension of existing theories will become uh, very necessary. Uh, in this case, it will generate new uh, groundbreaking uh, innovative research to actually extend or advance the current research that has been already uh, published or carried out. Okay, so this is the first question I would like to ask. And then uh, I would like to point out some possible research directions. And this actually is a very selective. It's not uh, comprehensive at all. Uh, it's just uh, uh, from uh, economics perspective, um, what are the possible research topics, research directions uh, that may, uh, may uh, become relevant uh, in, uh, in your future uh, studies. Um, so from, uh, uh, I will talk uh, this uh, from a behavioral economics perspective. So in traditional uh, economic uh, research, normally uh, uh, the consumers or uh, uh, tourists are considered to be rational, uh, rational, uh, rush, uh, rational, which means they will make decisions um, uh, in the, um, Predicted, predict, uh, predictable manner uh, based on uh, the constraints they may have. For example, uh, which destination the tourist will travel to uh, will depend on his income level, the cost of uh, travel to the destination, uh, and they actually make these decisions very rational. Um, but from what we have seen, uh, especially during this pandemic period, 
uh, human beings and tourists and travelers are not necessarily all very rational. They do not necessarily behave in a rational manner. Uh, actually, uh, uh, tourists or uh, travelers or consumers are em uh, also emotional, which means sometimes they make decisions not uh, in a rational manner, but uh, very em emotional, especially if they're facing uh, a crisis, pandemic, and also the, the pressure, uh, and so on and so forth. So therefore, the traditional economics theory may not be very useful to explain the behavioral changes as a result of uh, a rational consumer, uh, uh, emotional consumer, right? So actually, uh, uh, from a behavioral economics perspective, there are many theories and concepts uh, can be used uh, to study uh, the tourism behavior as a, re as a result of the impact of the COVID-19. I only probably uh, pick some of these uh, concepts or theories that may be relevant, may uh, need to pursue uh, in terms of uh, looking at uh, uh, you know, the behavioral changes of tourists as a result of COVID-19. Uh, the first uh, uh, concept that uh, uh, within the behavioral economics or, uh, you know, uh, studied by uh, behavioral econom economists is uh, a, a term known as uh, temporary, uh, tem uh, temporary disc uh, discounting, uh, which means, you know, people's uh, uh, perception of uh, certain things uh, actually changes over time, okay? So their behavior actually change uh, over time as a result of, uh, you know, uh, uh, risk changes. Uh, for example, uh, do we uh, take uh, uh, immediate reward, reward when we uh, travel to a destination or we will uh, wait and see uh, after the COVID-19. So uh, many uh, researchers and uh, uh, academics already started to look at uh, after the COVID-19 finish, finish or uh, uh, disappear, whether uh, the tourists actually will suddenly uh, started to travel abroad and release uh, the uh, the travel desire and uh, what we call uh, uh, started the revenge travel. Or they will uh, wait and see uh, until, you know, the COVID-19 uh, crisis or risk has completely subsided. So this is the, uh, something that uh, uh, we can uh, start to look at, uh, how the tourist uh, was uh, uh, started to travel, to make decisions, to purchase international uh, travels, and whether they will start immediately after COVID-19 or open, uh, the border is open, or they will still travel in the sea. One of the example uh, recent analysis that, uh, for example, uh, Macau, because uh, it control COVID-19 so well, it's not uh, uh, single cases for many, many months, and also it has started to open uh, its border. Uh, to the uh, Chinese uh, mainland uh, tourists, especially in the uh, GBA area, but actually there's not a lot for tourism rush into uh, visit Macau. Uh, so that's probably is the attitude, uh, wait and see, and they actually will give some time to consider uh, whether they will travel to a certain destination or not, right? And also another uh, behavioral uh, economics term is called uh, loss aversion. Uh, although we uh, love to win, uh, you know, no matter what we're trying to do, we love to win, right? But we also hate to lose uh, much more, even more. Uh, which means actually if there's a negative risk or if there's a, a negative um, uh, impact uh, of COVID-19, on travel uh, behavior, um, perhaps the impact will be much bigger, right, uh, uh, than the positive impact. So that's why, uh, uh, you know, when there's a, a crisis, uh, people become more cautious. They are more risk 
uh, aversion uh, instead of uh, a risk uh, risk love, right? Risk love. So this is actually trying to uh, to avoid possible uh, damages or risk that may occur when they uh, they travel, and therefore their reaction. Uh, 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 in terms of their demand for travel or the, uh, their choice of destinations, uh, and also the influencing factors, uh, actually the, the, uh, the reaction of uh, demand for travel uh, to the influencing factors actually are different uh, between the normal time and also the uh, crisis uh, time. So that's uh, something that the economists can look at, right? So that is what we, ca we also call it uh, asymmetric uh, uh, influence uh, of um, uh, travel decisions uh, by the uh, influencing factors. Uh, another uh, uh, term that ha has been quite often used in uh, uh, behavioral economics is called anchoring and framing. And this is especially uh, uh, useful uh, for uh, policy making. Uh, in terms of how the information are transmitted uh, to the uh, to tourists and how the uh, the information are framed uh, so that the tourists will react to this different framing uh, in terms of information provided uh, by uh, the authorities for example so during the pandemic period how do you frame the information actually will have a profound impact on their decision in terms of whether they will travel uh, or not. Uh, and also, uh, the, as a human being, we are quite often actually relies on uh, the initial information we received, and this actually formed our b uh, initial behavior. And then actually, uh, although in the future this information may evolve, may change, but we still actually uh, believe much more uh, in the initial information we receive, right? So this actually uh, will uh, have an uh, impact uh, uh, in terms of how we uh, receive the COVID-19 information because nowadays we know there's so much misinformation going around uh, on the uh, uh, COVID-19 and also a lot of uh, uh, conspiracy theories and so on and so forth. Uh, we have to be careful because uh, a human being and also consumers tend to uh, trust the initial information they receive received uh, very much. So these actually are uh, the things that uh, are relevant to our research. And also uh, another term, which is uh, mental accounting. Uh, basically, as consumers, uh, our decision is based on how much income we, uh, we receive, right? So uh, actually, uh, the travel decision of tourists is constrained by the income level uh, of a, a tourist. If they uh, receive a high income, it is very likely they will travel to uh, uh, far away or expensive uh, destinations uh, than if they have a lower income. But the, uh, the consumers actually sometimes class classify their income subjectively, uh, which may lead to uh, irrational uh, expenditures or ex uh, uh, irrational uh, spending. For example, uh, especially during the COVID-19 period, uh, because certain group uh, of uh, people has been affected much more than others, uh, different organizations and uh, non-government organizations, even sometimes the government actually trying to uh, establish some sort of uh, uh, policies to encourage people to donate uh, their income or their, their, their wealth to support these uh, disadvantaged people. But then how do you uh, um, uh, design the policy to attract, uh, to maximize the donation uh, with a view to helping those uh, people affected uh, actually uh, have uh, uh, important uh, or influence uh, the actual donation of, uh, of people, uh, whether they will donate based on their regular income or their windfall or their uh, 
you know, uh, bonus, uh, for example. So they probably will tend to donate much more if they suddenly somehow uh, uh, receive a lot of, uh, uh, you know, extraordinary income. For example, recently the the, the stock market has performed so well, although the economy has been doing very badly, but the stock market somehow uh, has been doing very well. And a lot of people, if they invest in the stock market, actually they can see their, uh, their returns has been uh, increased significantly. But during this, uh, 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 if they really get this uh, 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 huge additional uh, income, and they perhaps they will donate more. So that uh, uh, will tell us uh, who to target and how actually we um, design the policy uh, in order to uh, attract more donations uh, to help these uh, uh, people who are affected uh, during the pandemic period. Another term uh, which is also quite often used, often used in uh, uh, behavioral economics what we, is what we call the social norms. And this actually is a very uh, interesting uh, concept. Uh, so, um, for example, there are two types of social norms. One is called the injunctive norms, which the society hope uh, you to hope us to do, versus descriptive norms, uh, what the society actually does. Right. I give you a, a example in contrast. What uh, uh, do we mean by these two uh, different uh, social norms? For example, uh, in um, uh, some uh, uh, Western countries, uh, USA, for example, and uh, although the government has been repeatedly saying that uh, you should wear a mask uh, when you go out and so, uh, keep social dis uh, distancing, but still there's a lot of people actually do not listen uh, to these uh, uh, calls and they still actually uh, emphasize uh, other aspects more uh, than, you know, uh, protect themselves and protect others. But in Hong Kong, for example, Although the government didn't actually call for everybody wear a mask when they go out, but everybody actually wear a mask when they go out. If they don't, they feel shame, ashamed. So that's actually a different uh, uh, social norm uh, in different uh, cultural background, cultural uh, setting. Uh, I don't uh, uh, mean to discredit one social norm against another. I think these both are uh, relevant and prevalent in, uh, in different uh, cultural settings. But this actually have a, will have an impact on their travel behavior, right? Not only actually uh, their behavior in terms of wear, uh, wearing mask, but also perhaps will also affect their behavior uh, in terms of how they will travel, uh, who they will travel with, and where they travel to, right? So this actually uh, is a very interesting topic that was well to explore uh, in terms of looking at uh, uh, different cultural and how the uh, uh, shape the social norm and how these social norms actually influence their behavior and also influence their travel behavior or, you know, their behavior related to hospitality, for example, right? So these are uh, some uh, very interesting things to, to look at. So these are uh, uh, some possible uh, uh, research topics. It's very selective. It's not actually meant to be comprehensive or inclusive. Uh, just trying to point out uh, some possible uh, directions that uh, you may think of. But of course, from those uh, uh, possible research uh, directions, you can extend, uh, amplify to other areas as well when you look into uh, specific uh, research uh, topics. Next, I will uh, uh, present uh, examples or uh, research that we have recently done um, using some of these uh, uh, concepts and theories. And this paper actually is already published uh, in a Journal of Travel Research, which is a SAGE uh, a journal, uh, recently published, actually just uh, 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 published online. Uh, it doesn't have a, a page number yet, but uh, it is uh, published online. Uh, so if you are interested in great details of this research, you can certainly uh, go to the website and download the paper and read uh, uh, the, the study. Uh, but uh, I only uh, 
uh, here I only present uh, the basic background of this research and also the uh, main research findings uh, and also illustrate how some of these uh, uh, concepts which I mentioned earlier are utilized uh, in this piece of research. Okay, so uh, we all know the uh, novel diseases uh, continue to emerge due to urbanization and increase of mobility, mobility of po population. Uh, this actually, uh, many public health crises have occurred over the last uh, uh, two or three decades, right? Uh, SARS, H, uh, H1N1, uh, MERS, and so on and so forth. And this actually is uh, something to do with urbanization and also the mobility of people. Uh, although uh, Professor uh, Chris Cooper mentioned that it is mo may also have something to do with the climate change, the environment, uh, but certainly it, it is closely related to urbanization and mobility, which mobility of uh, of population, which has been uh, confirmed by by other research. And also, tourism is one of the uh, one one form of this population mobility. Mobility. So, therefore, actually, tourism can uh, am amplify the negative impact if there's a, a public health pandemic, because they travel from place to to places and they carry. Uh, the virus from one place to another, right? So actually, it it is uh, it is a channel of transmission of uh, you know uh, uh, public health uh, disease, uh, pop, uh, uh, normal diseases, and this actually is also uh, well known uh, by uh, research done by other uh, academics. Uh, so therefore, uh, if tourism can you know, uh, transmit diseases to destinations, and this actually will bring some cost to destinations if the disease actually are brought in or amplified by tourists, uh, because you have to uh, use public health facilities and the hospitals if there's more people falling, falling, uh, falling ill, right? So that's just a, the social cost that may bring to uh, the destinations as a result of, of tourism. Uh, so therefore, uh, our uh, research, the, the key research question is to understand the factors that may influence the residents, local residents, attitude or response towards uh, the policies that trying to mitigate the social cost of tourism in the pandemic. Uh, so this actually is a very interesting topic because tourism can bring the uh, social cost to the destination. But once the, the pandemic occur, then we have to control tourism. And then the, so, the society, the economy will suffer because there's no tourism income brought in. And sometimes then the, ha the government will have to design certain policies to mitigate those social costs as a result of control tourism. So this actually is a very interesting topic. Uh, when initially um, the COVID-19 emerged uh, last year, early last year uh, in, in China. So immediately after that, we thought, all right, this is something very interesting. We need to do uh, research to look at uh, how to uh, mitigate or reduce the social cost uh, uh, caused by uh, tourism. And also, um, uh, the, to prevent and delay a transmission of COVID-19, uh, we need to uh, introduce travel restrictions. Actually, Professor Kuba already mentioned that there's a non-pharmaceutical uh, response to COVID-19, one of which is to, you know, uh, restrict uh, people from traveling to different places and also intervention uh, in terms of social physical distancing and shutdown of public and, bus uh, uh, and business facilities, especially the tourism and hospitality facilities uh, are uh, affected most. Therefore, our uh, first uh, research objective is to examine the government policies designed to mitigate the social cost of tourism. Because the social cost has occurred, 
as a result of uh, intervention and also uh, the re travel restriction. Uh, and we need to look at uh, uh, what type of the policy need to be designed to mitigate, to reduce, uh, minimize uh, this social cost. So this is one first uh, uh, research objective. And then the second objective at the bottom of this screen is to explore uh, the effect uh, uh, of uh, information framing on residents' attitude towards tourism social cost mitigation policies. So as you can see, this particular research is looking at uh, the policy, uh, uh, the government policy in terms of, uh, uh, you know, mitigating uh, the social cost uh, of tourism. Um, as, as, as a result of these uh, uh, interventions and restrictions. Um, so uh, in order to uh, formulate effective policies, you have to communicate the policy very clearly uh, in a uh, perhaps right manner uh, so that to uh, increase uh, the public's confidence in your policy, right? So that's just, uh, uh, that, that's just uh, done actually through uh, a framing. Uh, we, we, so if you remember, one of the concepts I introduced earlier is framing. So how do you frame uh, the public policy uh, and uh, how to frame uh, the current social cost of tourism as a result of uh, COVID-19 to public and why you design this policy. Uh, it is very important uh, to make sure the policy is effective. So this is actually is our second uh, research objective. The third research objective is to look at the influence of framing and mental accounting on residents' willingness to pay for social cost reduction during the pandemic. Remember, this study is to look at the effectiveness of uh, a public policy on reducing the social cost of tourism uh, as a result of restriction, travel restriction, and so on and so forth. Um, for example, uh, especially during the pandemic period, uh, people who are employed in the tourism sector are badly affected. Many of them actually made redundant, right? So their livelihood has been affected. And therefore, different organizations, non-government organizations and uh, charitable organizations and the government sometimes actually trying to uh, take some measures to reduce uh, these uh, uh, social costs brought by these uh, 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 restrictions. So, uh, and, uh, and how actually uh, in the society, there's still a lot of people are not affected. Actually, some of the people during the pandemic actually are benefited uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, the situation, especially, for example, uh, the online platforms, uh, you know, retail platforms and the investor, uh, you know, uh, stock market investors, you know, and these people actually are make, make, m making money during this period. Uh, of course, they will be willing to, to help, to, do, to donate or to chip in in terms of uh, responding to government, government or uh, uh, charitable organizations uh, to donate their uh, wealth and their income to help uh, the people who are affected, right? Uh, um, but how can you actually attract more of these donations to people? And then you need to consider how people actually uh, decide to donate. Uh, who are the people most likely to, to donate? And this actually is what uh, one of the important concepts we use is mental accounting to understand how people actually classify their income and uh, which part of their income they are w willing to donate more. So that's just a, 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 a concept that we use in this study to look at how effective how effective the policy is to attract different uh, uh, people's response to your call for donation, for contribution, their willingness to pay for uh, reducing the tourism 
uh, related uh, social costs. Actually, so, uh, the design for the research, I'm not going to spend too much time, just uh, to let you know. Actually, we have uh, three studies. The first study is just to look at, uh, it's a qualitative study to look at uh, the existing literature or existing document to look at what are the policy has, uh, what are the policies that has been introduced uh, during the uh, uh, COVID-19 period. And, uh, you know, just to get a feel of uh, the different type of policies being introduced. And also what cost has brought uh, to uh, the destination as a result of uh, uh, restrictions of tourism travel. And the second uh, uh, study is to look at uh, the effect of uh, framing on residents' attitude towards tourism social cost mitigation policies, right? The third study is to look at the effect of framing and uh, mental accounting on residents' willingness to pay for reducing social costs on tourism during the pandemic. So these are uh, the three uh, small studies, um, all integrated together, actually. These are the, I, I'm, uh, in, because of time, because of the audience, I. I'm not uh, uh, going to explain the methodologies, the models that we use, and the experiment that we designed to collect the data, but just to present the result. Actually, the date we collected about 2,000 response uh, from three cities within China uh, during the COVID-19 period. One city is Wuhan, uh, one city actually is Guangzhou, another city is uh, uh, Hong Kong, actually three cities. Uh, so about uh, uh, 2,000, more than 2,000 uh, 2, respond. Every uh, city will have about six to 700 res uh, respond, respondent, uh, response. So this, uh, these are some of the uh, results. Again, this is very selective uh, uh, presentation in terms of results. But if you're interested in the detailed study, you can look at our paper. So first, positive framing induced response, respondents' positive uh, bias in favor of uh, proposing proposed policy measures as compared to the negative framing. So you have to frame your policy uh, positively uh, uh, to attract uh, more uh, donations or, uh, you know, positive uh, uh, response. And also respond who are employees in the tourism-related industry or currently residing in the cities with more confirmed cases of COVID-19 uh, perceive the policy measure is less in, uh, effective. I don't know why this uh, 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 is the case, but it's obviously uh, perhaps this is to do with the people in this uh, uh, city has already suffered too much and they are constantly uh, facing the negative information all the time, you know, how many confirmed cases, how many people died. So they actually perhaps, uh, uh, whatever the policy you design, uh, whatever the framing uh, framework you use, perhaps it is not very, uh, 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 not as effective as if the policy is uh, introduced in other cities where there are less confirmed cases. And also uh, residents' willingness to pay uh, for reducing the social cost of tourism in the pandemic through donations is influenced by mental accounting. And also, they are, don uh, they are more likely to donate if their income came not from their regular salary, but from other sources. Uh, so this is, uh, is uh, uh, interesting, but also uh, expected uh, research outcome. Uh, so in terms of contribution, this study contributed to uh, the debate on the effectiveness of uh, different type of policy, public policies in fighting against uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It has also contributed to the literature on residents' re uh, uh, attitudes towards public policy designed to mitigate the social cost of tourism and their behavioral purchase intention. The purchase intention here, donate, uh, donate, uh, donation intention, okay? And also framing uh, information positively will help uh, to uh, the public, public policy uh, to actually help to maximize the effectiveness of public policy, okay? And also in addition to this, uh, to a donation government anti-pandemic bonds, could also be offered to residents to reduce social cost of tourism during the pandemic. So uh, in addition to the, uh, you know, contributions called by 
non-government charitable uh, organizations, actually the government can also issue anti-pandemic bond, which is also kind of help uh, to uh, uh, monetary help uh, to the destinations were affected. Okay, this is actually is a, just a, a piece of research that we have done uh, for your information uh, to, to stimulate your research interest. Uh, but before I'm concluding, actually, I will use uh, this opportunity to, uh, to introduce two uh, important uh, journals published uh, by SAGE. Sage. Uh, one is a uh, tourism uh, journal of travel research, uh, which is a very uh, well-known, very important journal. Actually, it's one of the top three uh, highly regarded journal in tourism and hospitality research. Uh, actually, it is a Q1 journal, which means, you know, uh, as very top uh, of the ranking and the impact factor is very high. Is two-year average impact factor is, se is more than 7.7. .7. Um, uh, and uh, actually uh, 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 recently attract uh, quite a lot of submissions uh, related to uh, COVID-19 uh, 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 research. Another journal also published by SAGE is Tourism Economics. It's also an um, uh, uh, important journal, especially in economics area, tourism economics area. And, and uh, although it is uh, in the Q2, uh, area of this journal, but this does attract a lot of uh, good research from uh, tourism economists, and the impact factor is 1.8, is quite good. And actually, I'm um, currently, uh, I was invited as a, a guest editor of a special issue for tourism economics. And the deadline for this uh, uh, special issue, uh, the submission deadline, actually is 31st of April 2021. So we still have about uh, uh, two weeks, a little bit more than two weeks, uh, for people to submit to this special issue. If you have done uh, 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 very good research uh, related to tourism economics or economic geography research, please, uh, do consider submit your study uh, to this special issue. Uh, these actually are some of the areas listed here, uh, but uh, actually the submission are not uh, restricted or limited to these areas that are listed here. But if you think your research is relevant, uh, is related to consumer uh, tourism behavior, or even to uh, the supply side, the firm behavior or destination management related to, for example, uh, competitiveness or, uh, you know, destination uh, impact uh, of uh, COVID-19 on the tourism in the destination, you know, please do consider submit to this special issue. And this will be a, a very important channel for you to dis, uh, disseminate uh, your research. I think probably I have talked uh, more than I should do, so I'll finish here. Be happy to answer any questions. Actually, it's a bit over time, but I guess I should be okay. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Song. So by now, I believe our audience have lots of key takeaways. I, and I can see there have been already many questions in our Q&A board. We will answer the questions at the end of our webinar. So now let's welcome Xu Ting for next part. Um, hi, it seems I can't share. Um, can the host to can the host put? Uh, um, can you yeah, can get a wait, yeah, wait a moment, please. Uh, Okay, shooting. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Please go ahead. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes, yes we can. Okay. Thank yep. you. Okay. Good morning, Professor Cooper, Professor Song. Uh Sorry, good evening to Professor Song and uh, hi everyone in the meeting room. Um, I'm Shi Ting. Uh, I'm the manager for journal commissioning and book rights 
at Sage Asian Pacific based in Beijing office. I'm very glad to join the tourism management webinar. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Cooper and Professor Sun, for your very inspirational uh, presentations. I think Sage is really honored to have you as journal editor and book author. So uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, how Sage facilitates researchers in academic publishing. I'll be uh, making good use of the 10 minutes. Uh, so for people who do not know much about Sage, uh, Sage is an independent, preeminent HSS publisher and a faster growing STM publisher. In terms of uh, journal publishing, we now publish more than 1,100 journals, among which 700 journals are in humanities and uh, social science uh, areas. Um, here on the screen, uh, I'm sharing some leading journals on tourism and the hospitality uh, research. According to the um, 2020 Journal Citation Report, SSCI collection by Collaborate Analytics, there are 29 tourism, leisure, and hospitality relevant uh, journals. And uh, here on the screen, uh, we can see the top 10 journals in this area. Um, um, these are published by different publishers, including Elsevier, Emerald, Telam Francis, and Sage. So at Sage, we have uh, seven most relevant journals on tourism and hospitality research, including uh, the Journal of Travel Research, the official journal of tourism uh, and uh, uh, travel research association, and also Sage's proprietary journals, tourism uh, economics. Uh, just now, Professor Song mentioned these two journals, and uh, uh, I understand uh, Professor Song sits on the editorial board of these two journals. I will be guest editing one special issue for tourism economics. Thank you very much for your contribution, Professor Song. Um, next, um, I would like to extend my talk a bit beyond uh, the journals on tourism and hospitality research. Here on the screen, uh, I share with you a small portion of Sage Business and Management journals. So Sage publishes more than 80 uh, journals in business and management, uh, including the Journal of Management, Australian Journal of Management, California Management Review. I know and understand that uh, some of the journals also welcome articles relevant to tourism and hospitality research. But please go to the submission guidelines web page of a specific journal you might be interested to submit your manuscript to and check if your manuscript content fit uh, the scope of a specific journal and follow the submission guidelines to prepare your manuscript. And Sage Open is a peer-reviewed, open access, multidisciplinary journal we launched in 2011. Um, it, it publishes um, research articles and uh, review articles spanning uh, social science and behavioral sciences. So as, as of now, we have published 250 uh, articles relevant to tourism and hospitality research. So authors uh, uh, can um, enjoy the benefits of very quality reviews, efficient production, global marketing and distribution, and of course, readers can have immediate and free access to the content. The journal is now indexed in SSCI and other key indexing services. 
Um, at Sage, we care very much about uh, um, the author's needs and their publishing experiences with our journals. So we put together the Journal Author Gateway, uh, which is designed to help with author's submission and the publication journey. On the uh, Author Gateway, uh, there are a series of resources on how to get your article published, including a downloadable guide, uh, the links to how to choose a journal and how to submit your article videos. We also provide uh, author submission guidelines, uh, public publication ethics, and peer review process, etc. So please check. Please click and check the uh, author gateway for more information if you are interested. So Sage Journal Recommender is a tool that helps authors to find the right journal based on their uh, title and content. Uh, authors can go to the website and key in the titles, uh, keywords, to uh, search over more than uh, 1,000 journals and compare those most relevant journals to your manuscript. And the results could be limited to journals which are indexed or open access journals or journals that participate in SagePath, which is a free article transfer service providing expert advice on uh, preparing your manuscript to the journal, which might be the best fit to your manuscript. I would like also to share with you some other digital resources here at Sage for business and management schools, helping uh, academic researchers, instructors, and students with their research um, in teaching and learning. So Sage Business and Management uh, Cases provides you more than 4,000 uh, cases for students and uh, teachers to discuss in their uh, class. Um, Sage eBook platform uh, hosts more than 5,000 uh, titles and we have 500 plus titles in business and management. Here I show you the, uh, the cover um, of books authored by Professor Cooper. Uh, the Sage Handbook of Tourism Management is hosted on our uh, e-platform. Uh, apart from the Sage Business and eBooks, we also provide uh, academic collections of videos uh, to adapt to the environment of uh, online teaching and learning. So the Sage Research Methods video, Marketer Research, basically is, uh, tells you the techniques on how to collect and analyze data. And uh, the video business and management collection, video leadership uh, connections, basically provide uh, um, the professional knowledge in, uh, in the format of short video and uh, deliver uh, this uh, the knowledge in a more engaging way. So all these resources are hosted in, on one single platform called Sage Knowledge. So we welcome uh, researchers, instructors, and students to click and check. Uh, so that's all for my presentation. Thank you for your listening. And uh, uh, if you have any queries about Say Journals, please contact me. And if you are interested in uh, trial to the uh, business and management resources, you can contact uh, my colleague by the email address on the screen. And for people uh, in mainland China or who, uh, apart, who pe people use the WeChat, uh, uh, we welcome you to uh, follow us, the Sage News, by scanning the QR code on the screen. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Shuting.
So uh, let's come to the Q and A session. We have we have uh, nine questions in total, and for the first question one to four is for Professor Cooper, and following question five to eight are for Professor Song. And the last one, I have a question for Xu Ting. So can I share my screen? Yes, so uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. So let's start from question one for Professor Cooper. Okay. Yes, I, I, I agree that the travel bubbles have been really an issue because of prem, op, opening up travel prematurely. I think what, what we what we hopefully will see as we move into the future will be a more cautious approach. I, I spoke of the travel of the traffic light approach um, when I did my presentation, and that's the way the UK is going. So green, you won't have to comp, uh, quarantine if you visit a, a country. Amber, there will be a certain degree of quarantine, and red will be quite severe and expensive um, quarantine. So I, I think the questioner, I think the question there about is it damaging to gain trust, I think is, is very interesting. It's this issue of balancing risk and, and opportunity, if you like. So I think what we will see is more caution, and I think the travel bubbles will continue to, to be established, but in a more cautious way. I don't, hi, and I don't know if you've got anything on that as well. Yeah, I think you uh, you 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 answer perfectly. So I don't have uh, any further uh, addition. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's on to question two. I haven't seen a great deal on the views of travellers towards vaccine passports. What we are seeing here in the media is a backlash against vaccine passports because they seem to be discriminatory against those people who have not been vaccinated. So there is talk here in the UK of having to show some sort of vaccine ID before you're allowed into a football game or even before you're allowed into a restaurant. That will be quite discriminatory and I think it's going to cause quite a lot of social unrest if it comes to pass. So at the moment, I haven't seen a lot on vaccine passports but I think it will become, if, if they're introduced and the European Union is already looking at this, I think if they are introduced, it will be a, a very interesting area of research, particularly in terms of those that are excluded by this. Okay, so next question is, can I see the question three? Okay. I think if you're doing research on entrepreneurs, then there are a number of angles you can take. And, and my strong advice would be work in your, your disciplinary comfort zone. If you're a geographer or an economist or a sociologist, depending on what your background is, orientate your research in, in, into that direction. I think the whole area of entrepreneurship in cities is a really interesting one. And as I mentioned in my presentation, what we've seen in this country is a growth of entrepreneurs from people who have been in lockdown, come up with an idea, and then established a small business. So it's a really interesting area uh, in terms of linking entrepreneurship with innovation as well. But as I say, what I would be looking at is is, is my my you know my host discipline, if you like. I'm, I'm a geographer, for example. So I, I think like a geographer. I think about places. I think about destinations. I think about links. And, and I think that would be my my strong advice. I'm always very, very reluctant to guide people into a particular area of research because research has got to come from you. It's got to come from the heart if it's going to be successful. Yes, thank you. And now we have a question for Right. That's a very, very big question. <laughs> and 
it all it, it almost takes us outside of the scope of, of, of this webinar. I I do quite a lot of sessions with students on tourism futures and, and COVID obviously is, is part of that. And and what I am increasingly seeing is that technology will be the key to the future of tourism. And so I think the skills, the must skills for tourism students in the future will be technological ones. Um, I think we might see a tuning back of pure tourism content in courses and, and tourism skills, if you like. I mean, what are tourism skills? They're generic skills, really. And I think it's going to be programming skills and this type of thing that, that students in the future, people working in tourism in the future, not necessarily the next two or three years, but the next 10, 15 years, that's going to be absolutely key. And we are already seeing technology being used to, to combat COVID, but, but also to extend tourism products to combat COVID. I mentioned different realities, that, that type of thing. So a massive question and a, a tricky one to answer. And what I think we need is a shift in the tourism curriculum to cope with this. And that okay, might thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so now we have the question file for Mr. S uh, Professor Song. All right. Okay. So what are the key factors to attract international tourists post COVID-19? I think the, uh, the key factors, most of the key factors will still remain the same. Uh, for example, uh, uh, tourist income, the cost, uh, of travel to destinations, and also the cost in the destination, and also substitute uh, costs in alternative destinations. These are still the key economic factors that will influence uh, future tourist travel. Uh, but at the same time, perhaps uh, the uh, health concerns will be uh, important factors in the future. Uh, in terms of uh, determining uh, where tourists will travel to. Uh, therefore, uh, in terms of uh, uh, public health uh, facilities and uh, maybe the public uh, uh, you know, services, public health services in the destination will also play a role. And this can be uh, integrated as a risk factor in uh, international tourism demand. So I think this perhaps is something that will be uh, uh, worthwhile to look at uh, in terms of affecting uh, international tourist uh, travel decisions. Yes, uh, thanks. And uh, let's go on to question six. Okay. Can you please share what are the possible differences in travel behavior in West as com compared to Asia? Right. Actually, this is a very uh, interesting uh, question. Actually, there has been a lot of research done uh, in this area looking at the cultural difference and how the cultural difference influence uh, the travel behavior, uh, either in terms of a selection of destinations or the behavior when they are in the destination. As we know, one of the important cultural difference is that in Western culture, uh, individualism uh, is a key uh, social norm, right? So it is recognized as important uh, culture or uh, you know uh, no, uh, norm. Well, in Western uh, uh, in Asia, people actually are more uh, uh, behave in a, a collective manner, which is a collectiveness. So these actually are two different types of cultures. Therefore, their travel uh, behavior uh, tend to be different. Uh, Western countries, they tend to select an independent traveler uh, type of uh, uh, travel, where well, in the uh, Asian culture, people tend to go for group travel because of these uh, two cultural influences. And of course, um, the perception of uh, pandemic uh, 
uh, and uh, especially COVID-19 pandemic are different, which I already explained earlier. And therefore, their, uh, the influence of pa pandemic will may uh, also have a different inf uh, influence on the way people will travel from different uh, cultural background. I think these are some uh, very interesting areas that uh, need to be looked at it. I, I think uh, I actually myself uh, are thinking of doing some research in terms of uh, the differences of uh, travel behavior between Western and uh, Eastern uh, tourists. Okay, thank you. And now we have question seven. Uh, this actually is a practical uh, question. It's not actually a, a research question. Um, I think the government can introduce uh, various of uh, stimulus schemes. Uh, uh, for example, um, uh, social uh, in a pandemic bonds, which is a monetary uh, incentive. And also uh, in, uh, encourage maybe introduce uh, favor favorable policies uh, towards uh, tourism and hospitality businesses because uh, these uh, uh, businesses currently suffered uh, considerably. Uh, many of them actually uh, uh, had already been closed for quite a long time. Therefore, uh, the government need to have a financial support to those businesses to at least uh, stay put and sustain until the COVID-19 situation uh, is getting better. Uh, uh, this is not a particular research question, but it's, it's actually a policy or uh, practical related uh, uh, question. I think probably uh, Professor Cooper will be more uh, qualified to answer this question than I do. Okay, so uh, anything to add on, Professor Cooper? No, I, th I think I think Professor Song has, has has covered it really. The only areas that I see in terms of research is where the the research, particularly in economics, underpins how tourist operators can be assisted. What are the the points of, of in a sense where the the policy can intervene? So that that's the key, I think. Yeah. No, no. I think Professor Song's answer was fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And we now have question eight. So, Professor Song, please go ahead. Mark, how border lifted, but uh, no, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, this is like exactly what I meant by uh, consideration of a risk uh, by tourists when they decide to travel, although uh, both Macau and uh, the neighboring cities have controlled the pandemic very well, but still uh, the intention or actual travel to uh, Macau from uh, China is still, uh, is still not actually uh, uh, come back to uh, pre-COVID-19 uh, period. Actually, it's a long way to go. I think this is a uh, uh, this is actually tourist behavior somehow has changed. They are more cautious, they are more uh, risk uh, aversion, and uh, they probably adopt a wait and a see attitude uh, towards international travel. And uh, I think uh, this is uh, uh, something that uh, Macau uh, government or business need to uh, introduce uh, uh, policies or incentives, uh, uh, even marketing uh, efforts uh, in China or even ma ma many other uh, countries where the COVID-19 situation has been controlled. So promotion uh, and the policy uh, probably are uh, the th things that the Macau government uh, industry can do to encourage travel. Uh, probably will take time. I don't think it will immediate. Probably will take some time unless Hong Kong is open because many of the international travels travel to these 
uh, GBA area. Actually, they travel to Hong Kong and Macau uh, at the same time. So if Hong Kong is not uh, opened, uh, you know, Macau will be affected. Once Hong Kong is opened, Macau will benefit. That's what we call the spillover effect. So, you know, that's my two cents. may not be uh, exactly uh, uh, answer your question, but that's what I thought. Yes, thank you. And we have one more question for Professor Sun. Oh. <laughs> Why is there a big uh, disconnect between tourism entrepreneurship and research in tourism journals? And the entrepreneurship field is entrepreneurship journals. Yeah, I I think probably um, uh, this is uh, not many researchers uh, looking at uh, this particular research area. I know one of my previous uh, students who graduated from PolyU then went on to uh, City University in London and she actually looking at entrepreneurship and then she published in entrepreneurship journals instead of tourism journals. Um, I think perhaps um, this is an er this is a area that uh, many of you uh, can start to look at. Actually, entrepreneurship is very important, especially during the COVID-19 period. There's a, a lot of business closed down, but also some new business uh, are actually uh, being um, start, uh, started. Uh, this is a, a new business actually uh, much to do with entrepreneurship. There's a lot of entrepreneurs um, uh, take uh, uh, this uh, opportunity to de develop a new business models and start new business, and they actually uh, benefited uh, uh, um, uh, you know, as entrepreneurs in this uh, uh, particular COVID-19 period, I think that, you know, this is something that we should look at. Okay, cool. And um, so we now have a question for Xu Ting. Our question. Yes. Yes, and here is your question. You'll see for question 10. Okay, um, I think I'm not the uh, um, best place to answer these questions. Uh, maybe uh, uh, academic editors to for of journals is best place to answer this question. But um, just to share uh, with you my uh, experience of uh, um, of uh, seeing the journal seeing the contents published by uh, our journals. I think um, I research based on um, uh, some region or some country is still welcome uh, as long uh, as the in terms of methodology, uh, research methods is, uh, is sound and scientific and it has implications for uh, practice or problem solving in other places uh, of the world. Um, so I think maybe Professor Song and Professor Cooper could share your views on these questions. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, definitely still uh, 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 you know appealing. Uh, I think uh, if you look at uh, the papers published in uh, all tourism journals, actually the authors are from different parts of the world. And also, the research topic may be related to a particular uh, research uh, region or location, but you know, uh, international researchers are very much interested in what is happening in, for example, in in China or in Hong Kong, as long as uh, your research has a scientific value. Uh, you know, methodology is uh, rigorous and uh, the research is relevant and also, you know, uh, can be generalizable to other destinations. I think that's uh, uh, absolutely still, still you can publish uh, in international journals, even you are doing research related to a particular location or context. I, I, think, that, I think that's right, Hyun, but I, I also feel that there is a, a danger of, of reverting back to case study research. and. If we're looking at a particular single destination or a single context, I think it's important that you can generalize from that to, to say, what does this mean for other destinations? What does this mean for other tourism countries? 
Um, I, I think tourism research has, has grown out of the, the case study approach. It was very common, say, 10 or 15 years ago, and I think we've, we've come away from that now. Yes, localization, contextualization is important, but I think, as everybody said, the, the rigor of the, of the paper, is, is of the research, is going to be really important, and the ability to generalize from it is, is key. Otherwise, it's just yet another study of another place. Okay, thank you. And I think we have uh, one more question, and it's also the last question for Professor Cooper and Professor Song. It's about uh, compare the pre-COVID data with the post-COVID work. Okay, I, for you, okay, I can have a go first, <laughs> uh, and you can uh, add if you have more. I, I think, yes, uh, I, uh, this is a very good question, especially in uh, uh, economic uh, research. Uh, before COVID-19, uh, actually, if you are using econometric or statistical method to look at uh, the consumer behavior or tourist behavior, uh, normally, the data are quite stable in terms of the structure. Uh, but after COVID-19, everything actually stopped. And then tourism demand, tourism travel uh, uh, almost come to uh, uh, a stop. And this actually will influence uh, our research if we uh, include the COVID-19, uh, uh, the data during the COVID-19 period uh, it actually would distort the relationship that uh, during the normal period. And therefore, uh, you suggest that whether we should actually just using the data up to uh, before COVID-19, right? And if your research is to uh, discover the uh, relationships uh, between different economic activities or variables, uh, as a study, that's fine. But then if your research is to look at what is going to happen after the COVID-19 or during the COVID-19 period, you cannot discard this data. Um, for example, I've been doing a few studies recently on tourism forecasting. And uh, it is crucial that you need to predict what is going to happen during this period and beyond because the researchers and the practitioners want to know what is going to happen. So as a researcher, you are uh, obligated to provide uh, insight for uh, practitioners, uh, academics, and therefore you have to use this data. But then, uh, because this distort, distort the normal relationship, then some judgmental input need to be uh, uh, needs to be used. For example, we use a Dalphi judgmental adjustment approach, considering you know uh, different scenarios uh, as a, a result of this pandemic, and then look at how it is recover uh, within these uh, different uh, uh, scenario boundaries. Uh, in the future. So, yes, uh, if you are purely looking at the re relationship during the normal period, uh, yes, you can use the data before the COVID-19, but uh, as a researcher, I think we need to respond to these uh, changes and to look at how uh, these changes influence uh, or distort uh, the normal relationship and why and how this uh, uh, distortion can be reverted and how to revert this uh, distorted relationship in order uh, to guide uh, practitioners uh, in terms of recovery strategies and recovery decisions and so on and so forth. Okay, this is my thought on this question. You know, I don't know whether Professor Cooper agree or not. No, I do. Okay, so anything to add on? No? Yeah, cool. So thank you so much for your explanation. And I think that was our last question for today. And um, if you you love to ask questions in the Q&A session, we're working through this and get back to you as soon as we can. 
And you can also visit our website. We have lots of information on which we will be able to answer your questions. And we also have a great series of results about business and management. So be sure to check this out on our, on our website. And also please follow us on WeChat, Facebook, or LinkedIn for more academic support and the latest news. Um, if you registered today's session, we will also be sending you an email which contains this webinar's recording and other materials. There will be a survey after you leave this webinar, and we are very appreciated if you fill, the, fill in the questionnaires. And our apologies that we are not able to answer all your questions today. But once again, uh, thank you so much for joining us today and all for our today's webinar. And thank you, and see you next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor So and Professor Cooper. Uh, this okay. is a very great presentation. Yeah, Thank very you appreciate your, your insights. Thank, mm. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. May I ask a question? For your presentation slides, can we share yes. in the PDF yes. version? No problem. No problem. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, bye. See you. Bye, bye. Bye. Thank you again.